This is going to be Genesis 37. And we're going to look at Joseph, the greatest type of the Lord Jesus Christ in all of the Bible. Genesis 37 and verse 1. It says, And Jacob dwelt in the land wherein his father was a stranger, in the land of Canaan. Now Jacob is Joseph's father. And they're dwelling in the land of Canaan, wherein their father is a stranger. Now we're all, we already see a similarity between Joseph and the Lord Jesus Christ. You see, jo Jesus Christ left heaven to go to the place where he and his father are strangers. In John 1.10, it says, He was in the world, referring to Jesus, and the world was made by him, and the world knew him not. He left the riches of heaven and came down to a place where he was a stranger. And how much more so today is he a stranger in this world? Verse 2, These are the generations of Jacob. Joseph, being 17 years old, was feeding the flock with his brethren, and the lad was with the sons of Bilhah and with the sons of Zilpah, his father's wives. And Joseph brought unto his father their evil report. Now remember, Jacob has four wives. He's got Leah, Rachel, Zilpah, and Bilhah. Out of those four wives, Joseph's mother would be Rachel. And he's got all these other brothers and sisters by all of, well, all these other brothers and a sister by the three other women that are married to Jacob. And Joseph is a young man. He's 17 years old. And it says he's feeding the flock with his brethren. So you know what that means? That means he is a shepherd. Another similarity. What is Jesus Christ? 1 Peter 5, 4 calls him the chief shepherd. What does Jesus call himself in John 10, 11? I am the good shepherd. The good shepherd giveth his life for the sheep. In Isaiah 40, 10 through 11, it says, Behold, the Lord God will come with, uh, with strong hand, and his arm shall rule for him. Behold, his reward is with him, and his work before him. He shall feed his flock like a shepherd. He shall gather the lambs with his arm, and carry them in his bosom, and shall gently lead those that are with young. So they're both shepherds. And it says, And the lad was with the sons of Bilhah and with the sons of Zilpah, his father's wives. And Joseph brought unto his father their evil report. Joseph is what the kids would call a tattletale. He brought their evil report. He's what the teens would call a snitch. He's what a lot of people in prison might call a narc. You know, he sees what they're doing. They're doing evil. He goes and tells their evil report. And that's uh, just like the Lord Jesus Christ because he was a constant reminder of their evil deeds being wrong, just like the Lord is. In John 7, 7, it says about the Lord, the Lord said, The world cannot hate you, but me it hateth, because I testify of it that the works thereof are evil. So Joseph brought their evil report of his brethren Jesus did the same thing. He testified that the works of this world are evil. He pointed it out. He let it be known. And I guess you could say that Joseph acted as a mediator or a go-between, and so does the Lord. In uh, 1 Timothy 2, 5, it says, For there is one God and one mediator between God and men, the man Christ Jesus. So Joseph, he always snitched on his brothers. And take note that these are all half-brothers. You know, Rachel, Joseph's mom, only had him and Benjamin. So the rest of the brothers were the sons of Bilhah, Zilpah, Zilpah, and Leah. Well, that's also like the Lord Jesus Christ because all of Jesus Christ's brothers were only half-brothers as well. This is because God is his father, is the father. Jesus Christ is the son of God. Genesis 37.3, Now Israel loved Joseph more than all his children. 
because he was the son of his old age, and he made him a coat of many colors. So Joseph is the favorite, and everyone would have been compared to Joseph. He had the preeminence, just like the Lord in Colossians 1.18. It says about the Lord, it says, and he is the head of the body, the church, who is the beginning, the firstborn from the dead, that in all things he might have the preeminence. Joseph was the favorite. He was given the preeminent place. The Lord Jesus Christ ought to have the preeminent place. Next, Jesus Christ is the beloved son. In Mark 1.11, it says, And there came a voice from heaven, saying, Thou art my beloved son, in whom I am well pleased. Jesus is the beloved son. And in Genesis 37, 3, it says, Now Israel loved Joseph more than all his children. Just like Joseph is the beloved son, Jesus is the beloved son. Next, Joseph was the son of Jacob's old age, just as Jesus Christ is the son of the father's old age. In Isaiah 57, 15, it says, For thus saith the high and lofty one that inhabiteth eternity. Jesus is the son of the eternal one just as Joseph was the son of Jacob, an old man. Next, there are both miracle births. Because remember that Rachel, Joseph's mom, had been barren for 20 years before she had him. It was a miracle that she had him. And remember that Jesus Christ is an even bigger miracle birth because of his virgin birth. Also remember that Joseph is the firstborn of Rachel, and Jesus is the firstborn of Mary. And remember that Jacob loved Joseph so much that he made him a special coat. He made him a coat of many colors. And the Lord also had a special coat. In John nineteen twenty three, it says, Then the soldiers, when they had crucified Jesus, took his garments and made four parts to every soldier apart, and also his coat. Now, the coat was without seam, woven from the top throughout. So, he's got a special coat here. And the Bible describes the Lord wearing the universe in a similar fashion as he wore that coat. And one day, he will change his coat and put on a new heaven and a new earth. It says in Hebrews 1, 10 through 12, And thou, Lord, in the beginning hast laid the foundation of the earth. And the heavens are the works of thine hands. They shall perish, but thou remainest. And they shall all wax old as doth a garment. And as a vesture, thou shalt fold them up, and they shall be changed. But thou art thy same, and thy years shall not fail. So it's like the, the Lord's wearing the universe like a coat. And it's like a coat that's without seam, woven through from the top throughout, and he puts it over his head, and his head just goes through the top. But one day, that that coat's going to be ripped off, destroyed, and he's going to put on a new one, a new heavens and a new earth. Joseph had a special coat of many colors. Jesus has a special coat. Jesus Christ is our high priest, right? Well, the high priest's coat is made up of many colors. In Exodus 28, 5 through 6, it says, And they shall take gold and blue and purple and scarlet and fine linen, and they shall make the ephod of gold, of blue, of purple, of scarlet, and fine twine linen with cunning work. That was the priest, priest's coat there. So Jesus Christ is our high priest. What does the high priest have? A coat of many colors or garments of many colors and around God's throne are also many colors and revelation 4 3 it says and he that set was to look upon like a jasper and a sardine stone and there was a rainbow round about the throne and sight like unto an emerald so you see the similarities are just uncanny between the Lord and Joseph Genesis 37, 4, And when his brethren saw that their father loved him more than all his brethren, they hated him and could not speak peaceably unto him. Well, the Lord Jesus was also hated for his prophecies and parables. Read the Gospels and you'll see the hatred that the Pharisees had for Jesus Christ. 
They didn't have a kind word to say to him. Just as Joseph's brothers were envious and had nothing good to say to him or about him. In Genesis 37, 5, it says, And Joseph dreamed a dream, and he told it his brethren, and they hated him yet the more. They hated their own brother. You see, the same way Joseph's brothers hated him for his dreams, the people hated Jesus because of his parables. In Mark 12, 12, it says, And they sought to lay hold on him, but feared the people, for they knew that he had spoken the parable against him, and they left him and went their way. So you see, Jesus was going around telling these parables, and he would say it to the face of these Pharisees and people, and they would realize that that parable was about them, and they would hate him for that reason. Just like those dreams that Joseph had, uh, his brothers hated him for that reason. Genesis 37, 6, and he said unto them, Hear, I pray you, this dream which I have dreamed. Notice he says, Hear, I pray you. Well, this reminds us of the Lord's favorite saying, in Matthew 13, 9, he, sa he says, Who hath ears to hear, let him hear. Or in Revelation chapters 2 through 3, over and over again, he says, He that hath an ear, let him hear. You see, Joseph wants his brothers to hear about his dreams. He doesn't understand that it will make them hate him. He doesn't have an ego problem. He just knows what he dreamed. In Genesis 37, 7, it says, For behold, we were binding sheaves in the field. And lo, my sheaf arose and also stood upright. And behold, your sheaf stood round about and made obeisance to my sheaf. So in his dream, he was binding sheaves in the field. And all of a sudden, the sheaves rise up and the brother's sheaves bow down to his. And they made ob obeisance to his. Now, Joseph is the second to youngest brother. So you can imagine how mad this would have made the these older brothers that are way older than him, hearing that they're going to bow down to their younger brother. It probably made them as mad as the Pharisees got when a 30-something-year-old Jesus Christ proclaimed to be better than Abraham. And if he's proclaiming to be better and before Abraham... He's telling them that he's better than better and before them. In John eight fifty six through 59, Jesus said, Your father Abraham rejoiced to see my day, and he saw it and was glad. Then said the Jews unto him, Thou art not yet fifty years old, and hast thou seen Abraham? Jesus said unto them, Verily, verily, I say unto you, Before Abraham was, I am. Then took they up stones to cast at him, but Jesus hid himself and went out of the temple, going through the midst of them, and so passed by. In Matthew 13, the Lord preaches 12 parables to match the 12 tribes of Israel. And in Joseph's dream, he has 12 sheaves that represent the 12 tribes of Israel. So there's another similarity. And the bowing of the sheaves also pictures the Jews bowing down to Jesus Christ one day. You see, everybody one day is going to bow down to Jesus Christ. Joseph was dreaming that he was out in the field binding sheaves, and all of his brother's sheaves got up and bowed down to his. In Romans fourteen eleven, it says, For it is written, As I live, saith the Lord, every knee shall bow to me, and every tongue shall confess to God. You see, every knee shall bow to the Lord Jesus Christ. It won't be long, and jo Joseph's brothers will be bowing down to him. Both Joseph and Jesus have their brethren bowing down to him. And sheaves can refer to people in the Bible. In Psalm 126, 6, it says, He that goeth forth and weepeth, bearing precious seed, shall doubtless come again with rejoicing, bringing his sheaves with him. Oh, and the field that they're in, in the dream, can represent the world. Matthew thirteen thirty eight. Jesus says, the field is the world. One day, everyone will come to Jesus Christ, the King, on this physical world, and bow down. Now, the first dream of Joseph involves the physical. Them out in the field with the sheaves, 
So that can picture the first time Jesus came as God in the flesh to this world. But now Joseph's second dream will represent the celestial and represents when Jesus will come the second time from the heavens in Genesis 37, 8. It says, And his brethren said to him, Shalt thou indeed reign over us? Or shalt thou indeed have dominion over us? And they hated him yet the more for his dreams and for his words. So he had more than one dream he was telling them about. And both G Jesus and Joseph prophesied of their own reign and dominion. They said, Shalt thou indeed reign over us? And Jesus was prophesying of his own reign as well. It says in Matthew twenty five thirty one, When the Son of Man shall come in his glory, and all the holy angels with him, then shall he sit upon the throne of his glory. You see, just as Joseph will one day reign over his brothers in Egypt, Jesus will also reign over his brethren in the millennium. And just as they hated Joseph and refused his reign here, they hated the idea. They also hated Jesus the first time he showed up in the Gospels, and they refused his reign. In Luke nineteen fourteen, it says, But his citizens hated him and sent a message after him, saying, We will not have this man to reign over us. They said, We have no king but Caesar. They rejected him. Now, Genesis 37, 9, he does this other dream, and he dreamed yet another dream, and told it his brethren, and said, Behold, I have dreamed a dream more. And behold, the sun and the moon and the eleven stars made obeisance to me. So this, this dream is about the celestial. So this second dream will picture the second coming. At this coming, Jesus comes from the heavens. Revelation says, Behold, he cometh with clouds. The sun uh, in, the, in the dream you got the sun, the moon, and the stars, right? Now, the sun will represent Jacob. The moon will represent Joseph's mother, Rachel. And the 11 stars will represent Joseph's brothers. So this dream here is very significant because this is what will interpret Revelation 12 for you. In Revelation 12, 1, it says, there, And there appeared a great wonder in heaven, a woman clothed with the sun and the moon under her feet, and upon her head a crown of twelve stars. Notice how it matches the dream in Genesis 37. And the woman isn't Mary in Revelation 12. It's Israel. Because that's who it is in Genesis 37. And Joseph once again looks like an egomaniac to everybody with this dream. But it, he doesn't mean any harm. In Genesis 37.10 he tells his father about the dream, and he told it to his father and to his brethren, and his father rebuked him and said unto him, What is this dream that thou hast dreamed? Shall I, referring, Jacob referring to himself, who in the dream he would have been the sun, he said, Shall I and thy mother, his mother would have been the moon, and thy brethren, the stars, indeed come to bow down ourselves to thee to the earth. So you see, you could interpret Revelation 12 with Genesis 37. The sun, moon, and stars, the woman there, that's Israel. And he, uh, Jacob's like, Shall I and thy mother and thy brethren indeed come to bow down ourselves to thee to the earth? He will. And so will the people to Jesus Christ one day. In Isaiah 45, 23, it says, I have sworn by myself. And the word has gone out of my mouth in righteousness and shall not return that unto me every knee shall bow. Every tongue shall swear. Every knee will bow one day. Genesis 37, 11. And his brethren envied him, but his father observed the same. So, Joseph and Jesus are both envied. In Matthew 27, 18, it says, For he knew that for envy they had delivered him. Mark 15, 10, For he knew that the chief priests had delivered him for envy. Jesus was delivered to be crucified because of envy. 
in Genesis 37, 12 through 13, it says, And his brethren went to feed their father's flock in Shechem, and Israel said unto Joseph, Do not thy brethren feed the flock in Shechem? Come, and I will send thee unto them. And he said to him, Here am I. So Joseph is in the field, right? Which is a type of the world. He's out there in the field. And it says, And Israel said unto Joseph, Do not thy brethren feed the flock in Shechem? Come, and I will send thee unto them. And he said to him, Here am I. See, jo Jesus is also sent by the Father, as Joseph is here. It says, Come, and I will send thee unto them. Well, Jesus was also sent by the Father. In Matthew twenty one thirty seven. But last of all, he sent unto them his Son, saying, They will reverence him. In John three seventeen, it says, For God sent not his Son into the world to condemn, to condemn the world, but that the world through him might be saved. In John five twenty three, it says, That all men should honor the Son, even as they honor the Father. He that honoreth not the Son, honoreth not the Father, which hath sent him. In John six forty, it says, And this is the will of him that sent me, that every one which seeth the Son and believeth on him may have everlasting life, and I will raise him up at the last day. So Jesus was sent. <coughs> Jesus was sent just as Joseph was sent by the Father, specifically in Genesis thirty-seven thirteen. And Israel said unto Joseph, Do not thy brethren feed the flock in Shechem? Come, and I will send thee unto them. And he said to him, Here am I. He says, Here am I. Joseph is willing to go and do the will of the Father, just like Jesus. It says in Hebrews 10, 7, Then said I, Lo, I come, and the volume of the book is, it is written of me, to do thy will, O God. In Genesis thirty-seven fourteen, it says, And he said to him, Go, I pray thee, see whether it be well with thy brethren, and well with the flocks, and bring me word again. So he sent him out of the vale of Hebron, and he came to Shechem. So Joseph is supposed to return and bring him word again. The father sends him, and Joseph is supposed to return back to Jacob and bring him word again, just as Jesus was sent and is supposed to return to the father. So verse 14 here can picture the ascension of Jesus. You see, he came down, he was sent down, and he was supposed to ascend back up, which he did. In John 20 and verse 17, it says, Jesus saith unto her, Touch me not, for I am not yet ascended to my Father. Then Genesis thirty-seven fifteen, And a certain man found him, and behold, he was wandering in the field. And the man asked him, saying, What seekest thou? So Joseph is out in the field, which is the top of the world, according to Matthew thirteen thirty eight. And a man asks him, What seekest thou? And look what he says in verse 16. And he said, I seek my brethren. Tell me, I pray thee, where they feed their flocks. So he sought his brethren, just as Jesus Christ did. In John 1, 11, it says about Jesus, it says he came into his own, and his own received him not. You see, Jesus came down. He was sent by the Father. He sought his brethren. He came into his own, and his own received him not. He's seeking his brethren. In Luke nineteen ten, it says, For the Son of Man has come to seek and to save that which is lost. Now back to Genesis 37 and verse 17. And the man said, They are departed hence, for I heard them say, Let us go to Dothan. And Joseph went after his brethren and found them in Dothan. So Joseph used a random person to make contact with his brethren. This certain man there, he used him to make contact with his brethren. Jesus Christ will use you, a random person, to make contact with the lost world. You kind of... <coughs> See, the Lord uses you to go talk to people and lead them to him. Now, Genesis thirty-seven eighteen, and when they saw him afar off, even before he came near unto them, they conspired against him to slay him. Just as they conspired against Joseph, so they did to Jesus Christ. In Matthew twelve fourteen, then the Pharisees went out and held a council against him, how they might destroy him. See, they were plotting against him. They plotted against Jesus, 
They plotted against Joseph. In Matthew 26, 3 through 4, it says, Then assembled together the chief priests and the scribes and the elders of the people unto the palace of the high priest, who was called Caiaphas, and consulted that they might take Jesus by subtlety and kill him. It's all planned out before it happened. Luke 22, 2, And the chief priests and scribes saw that, sought how they might kill him, for they feared the people. John 7, 1, After these things Jesus walked in Galilee, for he would not walk in Jewry, because the Jews sought to kill him. John eleven fifty three. Then from that day forth they took counsel together for to put him to death. Jesus got death threats constantly. There was constantly somebody plotting his death. Joseph was wanted dead by his brethren. In Genesis thirty seven eighteen, it even says that when they saw him afar off, saw Joseph afar off, even before he got to him, they were already plotting how they could kill their brother Joseph. Just like how Jesus Christ's death was looked at afar off. You see, they saw Joseph afar off. They were looking at him, and they were already plotting his death before he even got there. Just like how Jesus Christ's death was looked at afar off. Because you see his death in the prophecies of the Old Testament, like Isaiah 53 and Psalm 22, which was written way before, afar off, the death even happened, the death of the Lord Jesus Christ on the cross. Genesis thirty-seven nineteen, And they said one to another, Behold, this dreamer cometh. So Joseph was identified by what he spoke all the time, his dreams. They called him a dreamer. Jesus was identified by what he spoke. He was a prophet. He prophesied. He was a prophet. So they call him the prophet like unto Moses. Genesis thirty-seven twenty. Come now, therefore, and let us slay him and cast him into some pit. And we will say, Some evil beast hath devoured him. And we shall see what will become of his dreams. So they thought they could get rid of his dreams, just like they thought they could get rid of the words of Jesus Christ. Notice they were even plotting how they would lie about his death. They also lie about how the Lord died. You see, Joseph's brothers were going to say, going to kill Joseph and then say some evil beast hath devoured him. That's a lie. They were going to lie about his death. And they were going to lie about the Lord's death. In Matthew 28, 11 through 13, it says, now when, they were, now when they were going, behold, some of the watch came into the city and showed unto the chief priests all the things that were done. And when they were assembled with the elders and had taken counsel, they gave large money unto the soldiers, saying, Say ye, his disciples came by night and stole him away while we slept. You see, the brethren are going to tell Jacob that evil beast hath devoured Joseph. They're going to lie. And that's crazy because that's what Jesus Christ went through. When he was resurrected from the dead, what did those soldiers do? They got paid to say that Jesus' disciples came by night and took the body of Jesus away. You see, there was lies involving both the death of Jesus and the death of Joseph. And something else. Joseph's brothers were going to lie and say, an evil beast has devoured Joseph. Well, evil beasts are exactly what Jesus Christ faced on the cross. If you read that prophecy in Psalm 22 about the Lord Jesus Christ on the cross, in Psalm 22, 12 through 13, it says, Many bulls have compassed me. Strong bulls of Bashan have beset me round. They gaped upon me with their mouths as a ravening and a roaring lion. Then in Psalm twenty two sixteen, For dogs have compassed me. The assembly of the wicked have enclosed me. They pierced my hands and my feet. You see, when the Lord was on the cross, he was fighting an, in, an invisible world of evil beasts. The unclean spirits and the roaring lion himself are described as beasts he was fighting. Those uh, Roman soldiers are described as beasts. And what did they do? They tore him up while he was on the cross. Now, Genesis thirty-seven twenty-one, and Reuben heard it, and he delivered him out of their hands and said, Let us not kill him. 
So they're taking Joseph. They're going to kill him. But Reuben, his brother Reuben, speaks up and says, you know, let us not kill him. He See, Reuben tries to stop the brothers from killing Joseph, just as this man named Nicodemus tries to stop them from killing Jesus. In John 7, 50, Nicodemus saith unto them, he that came to, you see, Nicodemus, he that came to Jesus by night, being one of them, said, doth our law judge any man before it hear him and know what he doeth? You see, he was trying to, he was trying to stop the crucifixion of Jesus. Just as Reuben was trying to stop the killing of his brother Joseph. It says in Genesis 37, 22, And Reuben said unto them, Shed no blood, but cast him into this pit that is in the wilderness, and lay no hand upon him, that he might rid him out of their hands to deliver him to his father again. So Reuben's idea is to get him to put him in this pit, and he's going to come back later. Reuben says, Shed no blood. Similar to how Herod wanted to be innocent of the blood of this just person, which is Jesus in Matthew 27, 24. Herod didn't want to kill Jesus. Just as Reuben says, shed no blood. You see, Reuben was going to leave him in the pit and come back and get Joseph later. He was trying to do this to spare Joseph's life. And in Genesis 37, 23, and it came to pass when Joseph was coming to his brethren that they stripped Joseph out of his coat, his coat of many colors that was on him. So they stripped him out of that coat of many colors, that special coat. Jesus was also stripped in Matthew 27, 28. And they stripped him and put on him a scarlet robe in Matthew 27, 31. And after that, they had mocked him. They took the robe off from him and put his own raiment on him and led him away to crucify him. And then in Matthew 27, 35, and they crucified him and parted his garments, casting lots that it might be fulfilled, which was spoken by the prophet. They parted my garments among them, and upon my vesture <coughs> they did cast lots. So Joseph was stripped, and the Lord Jesus Christ was stripped of his clothes. Their brothers were envious of Joseph's coat of many colors, so they stripped it right off of him, first thing. And this coat of many colors was partly what led the brothers to being filled with rage and enough envy to kill him anyway. Just as Jesus died for all colors. You see, the brothers were envious. Jo Joseph was Jacob's favorite. He made him a coat of many colors. And when they saw that he made the, him this special coat, they were full of envy. And that coat of many colors is partly what led to his death, just as Jesus Christ died for all colors. You know, he died for everybody, no matter what color they are, red, yellow, black, white, doesn't matter what color. And in the Bible, you got it, all different colors of people being saved. In Acts chapter 8, you got the Ethiopian eunuch. You know, he died for all colors, red, yellow, black, and white, just like the song. In Genesis 37, 24, and they took him and cast him into a pit. And the pit was empty. There was no water in it. So the Joseph's brothers, they took him. They see this pit. They throw him right in it. The pit pictures the grave and hell where Jesus went for three days and three nights after he died on the cross. He went to the heart of the earth to set the captives free from the Old Testament. He preached the spirits in prison on the other side. And he rose from the dead the third day, according to the scriptures. But notice that the pit that they threw Joseph in was empty. This pictures how Jesus Christ went in this thing alone. All the redemption is done by him. He went in this thing alone. And notice that there was no water in the pit that Joseph was thrown in, just as there's no water in hell. And when Jesus died on the cross, what did he say? He said, I thirst in John 19, 28. The similarities are just there in every verse. And, you know, the Passover lamb couldn't be sodden with water either in Exodus 12, 8 through 9. And what Joseph being thrown into a pit with no water pictures Jesus Christ taking our hell in the pit. What does the rich man say in Luke 16? 
He said, Father Abraham, have mercy on me and send Lazarus that he may dip the tip of his finger in water and cool my tongue for I am tormented in this flame. He's in a place with no water. And Joseph most likely was in the pit for three days and three nights to match the time Jesus was in the heart of the earth. I don't know that, but it makes sense. But also take into account that later, uh, when Joseph is ruling in Egypt, Joseph has his brethren in prison for three days. In Genesis, 40, 40, or in Genesis 42, 17. So that could be because they put him in a pit for three days. Genesis 37, 25. So they got him there in this pit, right? With no water. And Genesis 37, 25 says, And they sat down to eat bread. And they lifted up their eyes and looked, and behold, a company of Ishmaelites came from Gilead with their camels bearing spicery and balm and myrrh, going to carry it down to Egypt. You see, when they buried Jesus, spicery was involved as well in John 19.40. And Joseph's brothers just sat down and watched. Although they don't kill Joseph, they are basically premeditated murders, murderers. They don't kill him, but they were about to. And, you know, by doing what they're about to do, they have no regard for their brother's life. They're premeditated murderers with no remorse because they are literally sitting down and thinking about what they've done or not thinking about it that doesn't really matter to them in their mind they not only sit down but they even eat you know when somebody murders somebody and then they go to mcdonald's and get a big mac and maybe the cops see that they they think wow this guy they say this guy had no remorse he was able to go slaughter this person and then go have a meal afterwards you know if somebody maybe has remorse like maybe it wasn't a premeditated murder or something most likely, they're not just going to go eat right after they shot somebody in self-defense. It's going to tear them up a little bit that they just took someone's life. But these brothers, they have no remorse. They sat down and looked at him in that pit. And that's exactly what they did to Jesus. It says in Matthew twenty-seven thirty-six, when Jesus is on the cross, it says about the soldiers, and sitting down, they watched him there and set up over his head, this his accusation written, this is Jesus, the king of the Jews. How could they sit down and look at Jesus Christ all bloodied up and, and naked and in humiliation? Because there's no remorse. It says in Psalm twenty two seventeen, I may tell on my bones, they look and stare upon me. Notice also that Joseph's brothers are eating bread. And I got to thinking about that. Who would have brought them the bread? Probably Joseph. You know, just like David was bringing his brother's lunch. Was Joseph bringing his brother's lunch? And Jesus Christ, so, you know, he brought them bread. Joseph brought probably brought his brother's bread. Well, Jesus Christ is that bread of life in John 6, 30 through 34. He is that bread from heaven. Just as the brothers eat the bread from the one they killed, we eat the bread from the one that we killed. You see, our sins put Jesus Christ on the cross. He was on the cross because of our sins. We got saved and ate the bread of life. You see, we eat the bread from the one that we killed. Just as they ate the bread from the one that they were going to kill. Another thing, Joseph was bound with fetters and iron. It says in another place in the Bible, in Psalm 105, 16 through 18, Moreover, he called for a famine upon the land. He broke the whole staff of bread. He sent a man before them, even Joseph, who was sold for a servant, whose feet they hurt with fetters. He was laid in iron. Jesus was also bound with iron in Matthew 27, 2. And when they had bound him, they led him away and delivered him to Pontius Pilate, the governor. And his feet were also hurt with iron. Remember, they pierced his hands and his feet. Now, Genesis thirty-seven twenty-six. And Judah said to his brethren, 
What profit is it if we slay our brother and conceal his blood? Now, this is my favorite one. It's just, this seals the deal for me here. Because, you see, you got, you got Joseph down there in the pit, right? And then his brother Judah speaks up. And he says, what profit is it if we slay our brother and conceal his blood? And this is Judah speaking. Did you know that the New Testament spelling in your Bible of Judah is Judas and Matthew 1, 2? And he's telling his brothers, what would be the point of killing our brother when we could make a, just make a profit off of it? And Judas is scary it. One of Jesus' disciples is the one who ends up selling Jesus out. Isn't that something? A man named Judas, which is Judah, Joseph's brother, sells out Joseph. And a man named Judas, Judas Iscariot, sells out Jesus. And Judas Iscariot was concerned with making a profit. He was concerned with money. Remember in John 12, 5 through 6, he says, Why was not this ointment sold for 300 pence and given to the poor? This he said, not that he cared for the poor, but because he was a thief and had the bag and bear what was put therein. Judas, or Judah, says something about making a profit off his brother, just as Judas Iscariot is concerned with making a profit off Jesus. And then in Genesis 37, 27, Judah says, Come and let us sell him to the Ishmaelites, and let not our hand be upon him. For he is our brother and our flesh, and his brethren were content. So they want to sell Joseph to the Gentiles, just like the Jews handed Jesus over to the Gentile Roman soldiers to kill. It says they were content to do so. The brothers were content about this just as Judas and others were content to do this to Jesus. In Mark 14, 10 through 11, And Judas Iscariot, one of the twelve, went into the chief priests to betray him unto them. And when they heard it, notice this, they were glad. They were content and promised to give him money. And he saw how he might conveniently betray him. You see, at least Judah, the brother of Joseph, didn't want Joseph dead. And maybe maybe he's not just doing this to make a profit. Maybe the real reason is because he's trying to get Joseph out of this, and he doesn't know how to get him out of the hand of his brothers. Maybe he sees him in that pit, and he's starting to feel, have a conscience about what's going on, and he's like, guys, okay, guys, let's not kill him. Let's just uh, sell him and make a profit off of Joseph. Maybe he's doing it to spare his life. I'm not entirely sure but either way the picture is perfect a man named judas suggests to sell out joseph just as judas iscariot sells out jesus in genesis thirty-seven twenty-eight, then there passed by midianites merchantmen and they drew and lifted up joseph out of the pit and sold joseph to the ishmaelites for 20 pieces of silver, and they brought Joseph into Egypt. Joseph being drew and lifted up out of the pit pictures the resurrection of Jesus Christ. In Acts 2.31, it says, He, seeing this before spake of the resurrection of Christ, that his soul was not left in hell, neither his flesh did see corruption. So them drawing and lifting of Joseph up out of the pit that pictures the resurrection of Jesus. But also notice this, Joseph was sold for 20 pieces of silver. Just as Jesus was sold for what? Pieces of silver. In Matthew twenty six fourteen through 16, it says, Then one of the twelve, called Judas Iscariot, went unto the chief priests and said unto them, What will ye give me? And I will deliver him unto you. And they covenanted with him for thirty pieces of silver. And from that time he saw opportunity to betray him. So Judas sells, is going to sell Jesus for thirty pieces of silver. Joseph was sold for 20 pieces of silver. Genesis 37, 29, And Reuben returned to the pit. So you see, remember, Reuben was trying to save him. He suggested putting him in the pit instead of killing him. So he returns into the pit, and behold, Joseph was not in the pit, and he rent his clothes. 
both Jesus and Joseph have people who mourn over their death. And here it's Reuben mourning over Joseph. For Jesus, it was Mary Magdalene in John twenty eleven mourning over his death. And then in Mark sixteen nine through 10, it says, Now, when Jesus was risen early the first day of the week, he appeared first to Mary Magdalene, out of whom he had cast seven devils. And she went and told them that had been with him as they mourned and wept. Both Jesus and Joseph had people mourning over them. Genesis thirty-seven twenty-nine, And Reuben returned to the pit, and behold, Joseph was not in the pit, and he rent his clothes. And this pictures the Lord not being in the tomb after his resurrection. And, you know, people came and saw that he wasn't there anymore. And when a man like Reuben here rents his clothes, he's tearing the clothes. It's a sign of mourning. This is where you get the saying, he's all tore up. You see, he's, he's tearing his clothes off. Genesis thirty seven thirty, and he returned to his brethren, Reuben did, and said, The child is not, and I, whither shall I go? He's like, the child's not there anymore. And both Jesus and Joseph are, are referred to as a child. In Acts four twenty seven it says, For of a truth against thy holy child, Jesus. Genesis thirty seven thirty one, and they took Joseph's coat. And killed a kid of the goats and dipped the coat in the blood. The blood of the kid, or the goat, pictures the blood of the lamb. That's without blemish and without spot. Jesus is the lamb. And notice they're dipping his coat in the blood to make it look like Joseph's been killed by an evil beast. And they're going to go deceive their father using this blood from a goat. Do you know that this proves that Jacob is still reaping what he sold after all these years. Remember back many chapters ago, he deceived Isaac by having goat's hair all over his arms. When Isaac felt his arms, he thought he was his hairy brother Esau. So Jacob gets deceived by something from a goat, just as Jacob deceived his father with something from a goat. And so they dipped Joseph's coat in this blood, right? Do you know what Jesus is coming back with? In Revelation nineteen thirteen, it says, And he was clothed with a vesture dipped in blood. Just as they dipped Joseph's coat in blood, Jesus comes back with a vesture dipped in blood. So Joseph's coat's been left intact, and they're going to use it to deceive Jacob. And it says in Genesis thirty seven thirty two, And they sent the coat of many colors, and they brought it to their father and said, This have we found. Know now whether it be thy son's coat or no. Notice they brought blood to the father. And this is a bit of a weak picture since Joseph isn't really dead and the blood isn't his blood, but it could picture how we need to approach the father with the blood of Jesus. And notice that the brothers don't identify with Joseph. They don't say, do you know, is, is this our brother's coat? They don't say that. They don't identify with Joseph. They, they say, no, not whether this is thy son's coat or no. It's almost like they don't see any, they're not connecting themselves with Joseph at all. They're coming to Jacob saying, is this thy son's coat this is just like people today because people don't want to identify with Jesus Christ. And one time Peter said, I know not the man. You see, when you get in that kind of a state, as Peter was in that situation, when he, right after he denied Jesus three times, he said, I know not the man. You can get in a, this state of mind where you don't want to identify with Jesus. Just as his brothers didn't want to identify with Joseph, they said, is this thy son's coat? What they really should have said is, this thy brother's coat, our brother's coat. Genesis 37, 33. Jacob, they're talking about Jacob. It says, and he knew it and said, it is my son's coat. An evil beast hath devoured him. Joseph is without doubt rent in pieces. You see, Jacob identified that coat, and it was Joseph's coat. You see, Jacob is deceived into thinking that an evil beast has devoured his son. He thinks he's been written pieces or torn in pieces by an evil beast. 
And this reminds us what happened to Jesus on the cross. You see, those evil beasts, that roaring lion that walks around seeking whom he may devour, those bulls of Bashan gathered around him and made sure that Jesus was written pieces before the cross and on the cross. They made sure that he was marred more than any man. In Isaiah 52, 14, it says, they made sure those nails and those cat of nine tails and those whips and that spear tore the flesh of Jesus. In Hebrews 10, 20, it says, by a new and living way which he hath consecrated for us through the veil, that is to say, his flesh. See, his flesh was just torn and, and just bloody while he was on the cross. You couldn't even recognize that Jesus was even a man anymore. That's how torn up he was by these evil beasts. And you may, if you could see that, if you went back in time and looked at Jesus on the cross, to you it might look like he lost. But you'd only be looking at it physically. If you could see it spiritually, Jesus Christ is, is taunting these evil beasts. You know, he's like, which one of you guys can even contend with me? You know, he's... And he's just showing his power over them. It it says it even says that he triumphs over them in the Bible. And and then he goes to the heart of the earth. I mean he died for us on purpose. He voluntarily he and he goes to the heart of the earth, grabs death by the neck, chokes him, and then I mean he resurrects, he defeat he dies for us just to defeat death for us. So it was. It may have looked like Jesus was losing, but he was winning easily. No contest. But he let them tear his flesh. He, he let them do that for us. And notice Jacob said he is without doubt written pieces. To Jacob, there was no doubt about it. He says he's without doubt written pieces. And that is the way the death, burial, and resurrection is for us. Because Jesus is dead, buried, and resurrected for me without a doubt. Without a doubt. But I have hope unlike Jacob. Unlike Jacob had at the time because Jesus is without a doubt, not only dead, but resurrected. There were too many eyewitnesses for there to be a doubt. And Paul says himself in 1 Corinthians 15... He said how that he died on the sin how that he died on the cross for our sins according to the scriptures, and that he was buried and rose again the third day according to the scriptures. And then he says, and that he was seen of Cephas, then of the twelve. After that he was seen of above five hundred brethren at once, <coughs> of whom the greater part remain to this present, but some are fallen asleep. After that he was seen of James, then of all the apostles, and last of all he was seen of me also, as one born out of due time. Without a doubt, Jesus died on the cross for our sins. He was buried and resurrected. Too many witnesses. The Bible is too amazing. We see it in our own Christian life. There's no way our life could be the way it is if it was all just fantasy. Without a doubt, Jesus died on the cross for our sins, was buried and resurrected, and he's coming back again. Just like Jacob said, without a doubt, he just knew without a doubt that his son had been written pieces. Genesis thirty-seven thirty-four, And Jacob rent his clothes, sign of mourning, and put sackcloth upon his loins, another sign of mourning, and mourned for his sons many days, for his son many days. Just as Israel will mourn over Jesus Christ. It says in Zechariah 12, 10, and I will pour upon the house of David and upon the inhabitants of Jerusalem the spirit of grace and of supplications. And they shall look upon me whom they have pierced. And they shall mourn for him as one mourneth for his only son. And shall be in bitterness for him as one that is in bitterness for his firstborn. So when Jesus Christ comes back, they're going to look upon him whom they pierced. They're going to see the, the, he, the holes in his hands and feet, and they're going to mourn for him as one mourneth for his only son, just as Jacob mourned for Joseph, his beloved son. Genesis thirty-seven thirty-five, And all his sons and all his daughters rose up to comfort him, but he refused to be comforted. And he said, For I will go down into the grave unto my son mourning. Thus his father wept for him. 
We know that it pleased the Lord to bruise Jesus on the cross because it satisfied his wrath on sin, the wrath of God on the sin of all mankind. But at the same time, the picture is God loved us so much that he allowed his only begotten son to die on the cross for our sins. We don't, we don't have any idea yet the pain and agony that the father went through seeing the son die on the cross. Verse 36, And the Midianites sold him into Egypt unto Potiphar, an officer of Pharaoh's and captain of the guard. So Joseph is sold again. And see, if the brothers sold Joseph for 20 pieces of silver to the Midianites, the Midianites probably made a profit off Joseph when they sold him again. And they probably sold him for 30 pieces of silver. Just like Jesus was sold for 30 pieces of silver. So, just an incredible story in the Old Testament. The greatest type of Jesus Christ is Joseph. And that was just one of the chapters about Joseph. Pretty much the rest of the book of Genesis is about Joseph. That was just one chapter. And look how many similarities we got. So many similarities that it took me almost an hour to go through them. But we'll get into more of this soon.